This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. And uh, to start us off today, I'm very uh, pleased to be able to uh, introduce Richard Falk. Um, besides all his other accomplishments, the most important one now is the fact that he is a permanent fellow of the Orphala Center. Uh, and it was one of my great delights when I became uh, director to inherit Richard's expertise and simply presence, quite frankly. Richard, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I thought you were going to say that uh, my survival was the <laughs> uh, uh, most outstanding accomplishment. Uh, let me say that I found very uh, stimulating and impressive the presentations yesterday. And uh, a lot of what uh, particularly uh, Clark McCauley said resonates with my own Oh, we, we arranged it. It took hours. <laughs> uh, resonates very much with uh, the way I th uh, have tried to think about uh, these issues. Uh, I guess unlike um, the presentations I heard yesterday, uh, I approach uh, the uh, subject matter of terrorism from an international relation, relations and international law perspective. And uh, just one reflection on yesterday's uh, presentations and discussions made me feel that it would be very help useful somewhere in this project to have some comparative material with uh, taking account of how uh, large-scale terrorist incidents are uh, appreciated in other major countries like India, Russia, China, uh, Japan, because it seems uh, I start from the hypothesis that there is something very distinctive about American political consciousness uh, that bears on the way in which uh, these large-scale terrorist incidents are perceived and how they are, and the response pattern that is generated by these events. I thought of it particularly uh, when listening to Michael uh, Stoll's and uh, Ben Smith's presentation. It would be very interesting to know if a similar pattern uh, would be encountered in uh, societies other than U.S., Israel, U.K., and U.S. I think there's something that they share in common uh, in relation to this subject matter that is different from what I would speculate one would find in these other major countries as a response. Uh, uh, the focus uh, that I want to uh, attempt in these few uh, minutes is to uh, consider what I call mega-terrorist, the mega-terrorist challenge, the challenge that uh, is associated with 9-11, with the Paris attacks, but also uh, given much less attention uh, the Madrid bombings of uh, March 11, 2004, and the London bombings uh, the following year, the, in the underground and uh, uh, bus. Uh, and my uh, interest in this is partly a, well, I should say as a, uh, just one other aspect of uh, 
the background to my own uh, way of thinking about these issues, uh, I began being interested in terrorism not as long ago as Michael, but almost uh, when I uh, became involved with the Israel-Palestine conflict. And what struck me about that uh, conflict was the degree to which uh, Israel succeeded in painting the Palestinian struggle in terms of its terrorist tactics. And that was used uh, very effectively, in my judgment, to erase the legitimate grievances of the Palestinian people. In other words, it was a very instrumental uh, use of the uh, uh, political politicization of terrorism as a way of addressing a conflict in a, in a manner that prevented its solution in a way. Uh, and Israel continues to do that uh, in dealing with Hamas as a terrorist organization that uh, exempts it from the need to uh, deal with the uh, grievances of the Palestinians, or at least it contributes to that uh, posture. And I uh, recall uh, anecdotally a, con a presentation I heard that John Major, the former British Prime Minister made, supposedly off the record, uh, in which he said that when he was dealing with Northern Ireland, he only made progress when he stopped thinking of the IRA as a terrorist organization and began to realize that they were a political actor with real grievances. And at that point, uh, the diplomacy began to uh, develop in encouraging ways. And he explicitly contrasted that with George W. Bush's response to 9-11, uh, which uh, he uh, portrayed as a way to make sure you don't solve the problem, as, as a kind of uh, block or inhibition on uh, the uh, impulse to find no matter what the, who the adversary is, some alternative to perpetual war, essentially. And I think they, the um, uh, mega-terrorism, in this sense of these very uh, uh, traumatizing incidents, which uh, challenge the whole political system, it's not just a uh, an event that can be isolated, uh, create this understandable impulse that uh, Hollande recently uh, uh, expressed a, uh, in his re reaction to the Paris attacks, that one should treat uh, terrorism as a form of war rather than as a crime. That, that this, this choice of discourse is extremely important. It's, underst it's understandable because of, the, as I say, the magnitude, the scale, and the uh, uh, exposed vulnerability of a society makes it something other than a uh, typical uh, terrorist incident that can be uh, isolated and addressed as it always had been as a species of crime. In other words, an occasion for perhaps enhanced law enforcement, but not the kind of event uh, that is the occasion for mobilizing a society for war. Uh, at the same time, the nature of megaterrorism is such that the traditional template of war doesn't fit very well. What, one, what a country does to uh, protect itself or prevail in war is really uh, rather inapplicable 
in most respects, or most crucial respects, in responding to megaterrorism. Uh, the whole idea of deterrence doesn't work, retaliation doesn't work. So that the mentality that is appropriate to war is not appropriate to megaterrorism. And if you uh, look carefully at the responses, both especially of the US, the 9-12 perspective rather than the 9-11 perspective, uh, I think one sees that the, the attempt was to treat what happened as if it was a conventional, well, not a conventional, but a species of war as war had been experienced uh, previously in uh, Western society or in modern state system. Uh, as, and, and the uh, immediacy of initiating a war against Afghanistan and then following that with the war uh, against Iraq. And interestingly, uh, by, uh, really by accident, I heard Donald Rumsfeld uh, speak on NewsHour the uh, second anniversary of 9-11. And he said a very interesting thing, I think unwittingly. He said 9-11 uh, was a blessing in disguise. That was his phrase. Now why was it a blessing in disguise? He made clear that it enabled the US to do some things that it wanted to do previously, but didn't have the political climate that would allow it to do it. If you may remember the uh, so-called Project for a New American Century, which was a neocon uh, text signed by many of the people that were very influential in the uh, uh, George W. Bush uh, presidency. Uh, they said, America needs a new Pearl Harbor. That was their phrase. And again, what that meant in that context, of course, this was written before, I think, 1999 or 2000. What they were saying is, we need a political climate that will allow us to restructure the Middle East. That's essentially what it meant. And, and they were particularly interested in, uh, they were very critical of, of uh, the elder Bush for not finishing the job in Iraq. And it was partly, you know, a kind of Freud, you can give it a Freudian spin and talk about the son wanting to outdo the father. But also it was uh, a sense that the strategic, the strategic interests of Israel and the U.S depended upon or would be greatly benefited by having military bases in Iraq and having uh, a presence in Iraq that would uh, begin a process of restructuring uh, the countries hostile to the West. See, and that, uh, th this uh, image was a, uh, that was in the Project for a New American Century, was a uh, elaboration of what earlier had been in the Netanyahu, Richard Pearl study uh, called Clean Break, which uh, advocated the political restructuring of a whole series of countries, including Syria and others in the Middle East. So what I'm trying to say is that the American response to 9-11 was intertwined with grand strategy, with the grand strategy of the US, which it, at the end, after the Cold War, shifted from Europe to the Middle East and was preoccupied with petro geopo oil geopolitics and uh, security of Israel and the containment of political Islam, af especially after the Iranian Revolution, as well as counter uh, proliferation. And all of those issues sort of focused on uh, this region. And, and the um, neocons were the ones that were most articulate 
in identifying this geopolitical shift from Europe to the Middle East. So, and that's part of, the, this is part of why I think uh, comparative study would be helpful in relation to megaterrorism, because these other countries don't have quite that same global uh, uh, grand strategy. They all have elaborate foreign policy, they all have a, uh, their own originality, uh, but what they don't have is this um, uh, global uh, security uh, conception uh, that has uh, really distinguished the U.S. from any other country that it has, in a way, ever existed. It's the first, what I would, it's not an empire, but it's a global state. In other words, it has, uh, it, it, its um, reach is explicitly connected with a capacity uh, to uh, act anywhere on the planet. And uh, no, other, no other country, uh, I mean, first of all, it spends more on its military machine than the next 10 countries, maybe 15, it, at one point was spent more than the rest of the world put together. That's an extraordinary thing if you think about it. Uh, and yet, it finds itself more insecure than it's ever been in its history. See, that juxtaposition seems to me to be very, very, and, and of course 9-11 uh, greatly intensified that uh, paradox. The strongest military power that ever existed, yet feeling extremely uh, exposed and vulnerable. And if you read the memoirs of the people uh, around Bush at that time, they were terribly frightened of their incapacity to defend the country. They really genuinely, I think, believed they, uh, that they didn't know what to do, essentially. And so they did the only thing that they knew how to do, which was to fight wars. Uh, it's not only the uh, military b budget, but it's also a thousand, or somewhere, it depends how you count, 700 to a thousand foreign bases, foreign military bases. In other words, a global network of bases, navies in every ocean, and the militarization of space. All of these things are uh, part of this uh, sec securitization network that is global in scope. And so, in my view, that creates a particular political consciousness that is overly disposed toward dealing with megaterrorism as if it's a, a predominantly military problem. And uh, exclude, you, uh, it's, it's interesting what the, the demonization of the other is a common aspect of responding to any kind of terrorism. You demonize the other until you're ready to make peace. I mean, uh, the IRA was demonized, the Basque movement in Spain, uh, South African uh, uh, opposition to apartheid was, Nelson Mandela was considered the leading terrorist uh, by the Africana elite until that was no longer a useful posture. So uh, yesterday's terrorist becomes today's Nobel Prize winner. Uh, uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a very much a manipulated and manipulable uh, symbolism uh, that is used by all countries. This isn't just an, uh, an American uh, phenomenon, or, uh, and Israel did it with the PLO, I mean, at, at one point. Uh, the famous uh, Rabin ha uh, Arafat handshake, in which uh, Rabin couldn't quite get himself to look at Arafat, uh, but he, the diplomacy of the moment, 
validated uh, bringing the PLO in from the cold and treating them as a political actor. So what I'm trying to express is the degree to which this way of thinking about and responding to megaterrorism, and I think this is where what I uh, have to say corresponds very much with what uh, uh, Clark said yesterday, is that it, rather than uh, solve the problem, it magnifies and intensifies the problem. And uh, Chalmers Johnson uh, reminded the world of the phenomenon of what he called blowback, which is a very much a characteristic of uh, what w the response to the response. So we think about the, the challenge and we think about the response to some degree, uh, I mean, not, a, not sufficiently. But th there's also, it's worth focusing on the response to the response, uh, which is, I think, uh, what we're dealing with. And one of the things, there are two things that are very radical about uh, these developments, uh, starting with 9-11. If you look back at the uh, relationship of the West to the non-West, it was always based on two, uh, I mean, or uh, fundamentally uh, structured around two kinds of flows. Uh, intervention came from the north to the south, and people came from the south to the north. You still have that. You have intervention uh, in the, uh, the Middle East and uh, in different forms in Asia and uh, Latin America, Africa, but you have the migrations coming from the south to the north. See, and, and, what, uh, and what the West had been able to do throughout the whole colonial period was to confine the violence to the combat zones of the south. And what, starting with Al-Qaeda, and continue, maybe, maybe intensified by ISIS, is the notion that, that these forces that are uh, seem to be uh, under the domination of uh, Western uh, power, Western uh, military superiority, they have options to strike back. They have the capability and the political will to strike back. See, before that, and if you even rather recently, uh, U.S. Uh, strategic planners were talking about zero casualty wars. That was the phrase used after the first Gulf War, and it was even more true in the uh, NATO war against uh, Serbia uh, for Kosovo, the Kosovo War of 1999 where the uh, Chinese had more casualties than NATO because we bombed the, uh, the uh, Chinese embassy was bombed in the course of the war as a way of telling them not to help the Serbs with targeting information. But there were no, there were no NATO casualties. That was truly a zero casualty war. Uh, but what uh, in the post 9-11 world, there are no zero casualty wars. And always it was a Western fiction. There were lots of casualties. There were just no casualties on quote unquote our side. See, in the, uh, that, uh, that whole notion that their casualties don't count. They're not even uh, part of the reality. Uh, but, but our casualties are what's all important, and this is part of what I feel are the wrong lessons learned from the Vietnam experience in the American political culture. And that is what the, what the Beltway learned was get rid of the draft, uh, the war was lost in American living rooms, embed journalists, uh, try to control the perceptions of 
what has happened. Don't let people see the uh, body bags coming back or the c coffins dra draped in flags. Uh, disguise the reality, and that's why no boots on the ground, but uh, develop weapons and tactics that don't involve our casualties. Uh, drones are perfect from that perspective. You don't even risk the idea of an accidental casualty. It's, a, it's in a way the perfect w weapon for the post-Vietnam uh, security conscious, uh, global security uh, consciousness. Uh, so what I'm, uh, I guess, all of this is trying to say that uh, the, the worst aspect of the uh, response patterns to megaterrorism are the uh, constraints imposed on political imagination of how to deal with this er extraordinarily uh, difficult and dangerous challenge. And what, what uh, has, re putting it in a very simplistic way, we haven't learned to think outside the militarist box. And if you don't learn to think outside that box, you can't deal with this mega-terrorist cha mega challenge. I think that's uh, the bottom line. And you, there's no way you can escape addressing the fact that there are uh, real grievances out there. It's, it's not uh, good versus evil. You know, it's not that kind of morality play. And it's quite interesting that even the, in this American political consciousness, we've recognized in the, the Afghanistan context that if you really want to get out of that situation ever, you've got to talk to the Taliban. And there are these secret negotiations that have been going on and off in recent years. In other words, talking to the enemy is part of living in the 21st century. And if you don't understand that, you, uh, one just one final uh, observation. You may have seen an op opinion piece by John Bolton, uh, who's not a favorite of mine, uh, but uh, he, he advocated very interestingly uh, that uh, one should uh, make a major military effort to eliminate uh, ISIS from the territory it occupies in Syria and Iraq. But once eliminated, one should acknowledge that Iraq and Syria are no longer viable states, and that what one should do is essentially do what the ISIS is doing create a Sunni state in the territory that is liberated from ISIS. In other words, accept their notion that uh, they were being persecuted by the Shiites uh, and that they had these substantial grievances. And if you saw the CNN film on the ISIS occupation of uh, Syria and Iraq, it made clear the point that the people felt as bad, and many of them were very opposed to ISIS, but they said it wasn't as bad as what the Shiites had done to us while Maliki was prime minister. And that's an important observation. So let me stop there before I'm stopped. <laughs> and. <laughs> that talk. Uh, is that going? So I want to pose to you the question of timing. And what I mean by that is that the big challenge of counterterrorism, and if you put counter, you know, counterterrorism in a very broad context and talk about it as 
political solutions to grievances all the way to uh, dealing with genuine imminent threats. To me, the big challenge of counterterrorism is a number of these things point in the opposite direction at the same time. So um, there's, a, I think, a security and a political and a, and a realistic imperative that imminent threats have to be uh, addressed, and some of those imminent threats either are never going to be amenable to any sort of negotiation compromise. Um, uh, you know, the Osama bin Laden who's continuing to plan the next imminent attack, while at the same time, the means that you have for dealing with that, that imminency undermine a lot of the other project, creating better governance, uh, trying to have a, a counter narrative that says that the you know, West is trying to, uh, has, wants to uh, ha create a society in the best interests of the people in the Middle East to advance education, health, uh, economic growth. So it's very difficult to do those two things at the same time. So I wonder if you could think about that. I think you are absolutely right. I mean, and, and it, it, despite everything I said uh, now, I favored the response to Afghanistan after 9-11 because I saw that just for the reasons you suggest, that there was an imminent threat that was very hard to evaluate. Uh, but I, I regretted my, uh, what I, I said it actually, unfortunately, in print. and. Uh, we all have that problem. And, and so I've had to, uh, so I had to live with it. And I was, uh, uh, you know, quite sharply attacked at the time for uh, taking such a position. Uh, but I, I, I think that is part of what I would call the appropriate political imagination for dealing with the mega-terrorist challenge, that you have to recognize the special quality of the imminent threats and try to address them, but you shouldn't overlook the reality of legitimate grievances, of root causes, of uh, trying to address the landscape out of which this kind of violence emerges. And until you do both, I would argue, you will not make uh, significant progress. You know, if you look at Bush's speech in 920 to the Congress, um, a lot of it contains uh, uh, many different elements. And he even had programs like, I can't remember the exact name, but the Middle East Initiative Program, which was about trying to, you know, build civil society structures and uh, the Middle East, and the problem is that the, that whole project just got overwhelmed, or, or that side of everything just got overwhelmed by Iraq. Uh, so, I mean, I think there was political imagination, but the like the Iraq War, the execution was just uh, miserable. Now, ask why did it get overwhelmed by Iraq? And it got overwhelmed by Iraq because they mess. always get prioritized the grand strategy, and it was only. Uh, you know, I, I remember that uh, that 920 uh, spe uh, speech, uh, and it, you didn't feel that there was the same, uh, that there was part of the speech was rhetoric and part of the speech was policy. And I would argue that the non-military part was pretty much rhetoric, except maybe for not turning against Islam as a religion. I think that was genuine. Uh, a genuine part of the speech. But the whole way in which uh, Saudi Arabia was treated in the uh, aftermath is, is part of this uh, trying to, uh, what shall I say, deconstruct the relationship between the mega terrorist challenge and grand strategy. Saudi Arabia despite being the greatest disseminator of jihadist Islam, has never been put under serious American pressure to stop doing that. And it's the, even with this reduced uh, anxiety about oil reserves, still the friendship, uh, the special relationship with Saudi Arabia exempts it from the kind of uh, response that would occur 
if, for instance, Iran was doing something like this. It's, it's these special relationships with Israel and with Saudi Arabia are very relevant, in my view, to how mega uh, terrorism has been addressed. Richard, I'd, I'd like to follow up on the, uh, your suggestion in terms of the comparative study of the, of the I think it's re that's really important. I, I expect you're on to a, a really important uh, observation. I, there's no doubt in my mind that they would respond differently. Um, it, it, even though it's still within the US, UK area, even, even in the response, if you look at what happened in after 7-7, as you mentioned, in terms of the way that the, um, that <coughs> excuse me, the way that the uh, British government and British press responded to the presentation of what happened on 7-7 versus the United States, um, you will see, you see tremendous differences. So uh, I have a study that, which we did with a former student here, Mary Brenson, in which we looked at the, the coverage in the elite papers uh, in the US versus the, the UK. And uh, along the same lines of, this, of what Ben and, and I and the others were doing in, in terms of this larger project, in terms of the long sweep on Al Qaeda, um, there, is, there are extraordinary differences. In, in the US, even though we, the country that we can cover best of any place in the world in terms of the correspondence, and location, numbers, understanding of culture, et cetera, uh, our, our coverage is very, very different than, than the British coverage. Um, the British rep represented Blair, who, who wanted to make sure that it wasn't, that the attacks weren't connected to, um, to the Iraq war, because politically it was, un, it was unacceptable to be attacked for having British participation. And so it was constant that it was, it was homegrown, it was not connected to anything else in the world, et cetera. In the United States, of course, that was reported, but it was overwhelmed by the coverage that, the, that this was part of the global war on terror, which was Bush's immediate response and all the administrative response. And it followed that, ta that tack. And so as a result, you get a very different response in terms of how people think in terms of the public and the elite think about what you need to do. Um, and it ironically, the homegrown terrorism, we did an, ex an experiment to see how this would affect population. The homegrown experiment uh, frame of this, we did a video compilation of news reports, um, made people far more fearful um, and willing to not to go to war, because that wasn't what they wanted to do, but to g give up civil liberties and to restrict not only their own civil liberties, but of course the Muslim population. Um, and the international threat, maybe because in the U.S. it wasn't any, it wasn't seen as big, but then the international threat just did not have that same impact. So the imagination that was generated by the way that it was framed was very, very different. It's, uh, I didn't know that, but it, uh, it corresponds with my uh, sort of uh, assumption of, of how, how these different political cultures address or frame uh, their responses. I was very interested in the Spanish response to the Madrid train bombings. I happened to be in Spain. Uh, I arrived in Spain the day that the bombings took place. And there was a national election a few days later in which uh, a pro-Bush Pre, uh, leader, Asner, was defeated and a new leader emerged. And the first thing that new leader did was to withdraw Spanish troops from the Iraq war. They had been part of the uh, coalition in Iraq. And the other thing they did was to make a strong emphasis on law enforcement. And they actually were able to find the perpetrators who were not homegrown, they were Moroccan, I believe. Uh, but it, it, it completely contained the experience. For, and for Spain, it was definitely a mega-terrorist uh, event. Uh, I was in Barcelona, and there were something like a million people 
that took part in a very moving demonstration the next day, uh, mainly with Catalan flags, not very few Spanish uh, signs of, of Spanish identity. But nevertheless, it was, uh, it was in solidarity with the uh, victims uh, of, uh, which were quite, uh, given the size of Spain, it was a sizable, uh, probably equivalent to uh, the casualties endured here after 9-11. Just as an addition though, one of the reasons that you saw that as a result was because the initial reaction by the Spanish government was to try to point fingers at ETA. Yeah, that's true. Even though, and most people don't realize this, but I have a lot of time on my hands, it was 911 days after 9-11. So that if you ever sat down and said, wait a second, it's, what's the date? You knew it was Al-Qaeda, but they tried. And so I think maybe the response of the Spanish government to withdraw the troops, and the election was an upset, in part because of the mishandling of the allocation of blame. So I, I applaud and agree entirely that we need to have this comparative element, because I think one of the problems, and not in this room, since there's a lot of people who've been working on terrorism for two decades plus plus, is that when everything we think and know about terrorism is shaped by that one event on 9-11, the prism through which we look at future events is so heavily contextualized, like along the lines of um, Michael the paper that you guys are doing, it's, you know, everything's Al-Qaeda. But when you take a longer look and you do it in a comparative way, and you can look at the Irish you know, provisional IRA, you can look at the dissidents. You can look at ETA and how it was absorbed. You can look at um, like Donatella de la Porta's work on Brigata Rosa, the Red Brigades, about how they became irrelevant because they went too far. I think that it's important that we understand the cases of things that worked is not in the Islamic sphere. It's what worked in sort of the older terrorist movements of the 60s. No, thank you, uh, Mia, for that uh, comment. And I completely agree that Asner uh, pointed the finger immediately at the ETA movement, and that was part of what people thought contributed to his defeat uh, by this kind of uh, uh, misleading and opportunistic uh, uh, way of responding. Uh, the one thing I would uh, say in your broader comment, uh, in response to your broader comment, is that it's important to contextualize beyond the terrorist subject matter itself. That's why I think in dealing with the US particularly, its grand strategy gets inter intertwined with counterterrorism. And what it, because counterterrorism is such an effective way of politically mobilizing support, uh, other things uh, that are not very prudent and not very wise get approval, get poli uh, find political approval. And the Iraq war is, of course, the poster child for that kind of assessment. Terrorism is the new baseline or new, the new norm of the postmodern world, the neo Westphalian world. And I think what the US is doing is we're trying to hang on to the old modern Westphalian world using that grand strategy. And mm -hmm. we haven't accepted the fact that times are changing. We're getting new war making entities like the cartels or IS or AQ. And you know, we're even seeing mercenaries return to the battlefield. And in many ways, it's very much like the shift from the medieval to the modern era, that level of, of change within the system. No, I think that's a very important uh, way of putting it. And uh, I think you see it in the military technology, uh, the shift to drones and the uh, doctrine, the world as a battlefield. You know, it's no longer state-centric in the response to mega-terrorism. And indeed, the uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda also see the world as a global battlefield. So you don't have the territoriality of conflict in the way the modern world uh, experienced and understood and prepared for it. So it is, as you say, a systemic 
change. And we haven't, uh, the people that are uh, trying to make the policy haven't caught up with the reality. So we're living in this kind of historical moment where the change, the be behavioral changes are not uh, addressed very uh, convincingly by the policy uh, or the govern governmental elites and the uh, policy elites. So it's a very dangerous time for that reason, or, or one of the reasons it's dangerous. Uh, yeah, Professor, uh, thank you very much for the, for the lecture. Hey, my question, I'm from Spain, and I wanted to make a question about, about this point in, in, in concrete. Uh, it's curious that in all, the, in all the countries, when there is a committed a terrorist attack, there is like uh, what is called the effect, I don't know how you say in English, join around the flag, no? Yeah. Roll around the flag, yeah. Well, you, I didn't catch that. Roll around the flag, like, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, like automatically, for example, the other day, it, we, were, we I saw some polls and some surveys that in Paris, the popularity of François Hollande increases automatically. Or, for example, with uh, George Bush or Tony Blair, the days after the terrorist attack, the same. However, in Spain, happened something completely different. I mean, uh, even when the, when the causes and the reasons why uh, the terrorist attack was committed could be more or less fair by by certain, by certain groups and could be understandable by certain groups. What explains that in Spain there is that, that lack of unity facing a terrorist problem and nor in, in other countries apart from the, from the lie because as you, say, as you said, like, uh, there was a moment that uh, Spain, that uh, the government said that was uh, the Basque movement who committed that terrorist attack, but even before, was clarified that was not uh, the Basque movement, the, his popularity decreased automatically. Could you, why Spain has that situation? <laughs> no, it's, it's a uh, uh, difficult, important uh, issue. And I, I think the, uh, one of the um, uh, pro uh, difficulties in, in uh, this whole terrorist context is that it is such a seductive way to mobilize political support. And as you say, it can opportunistically create this kind of uh, artificial unity and uh, patriot, uh, patriotic uh, uh, a surge of enthusiasm that gives the governing elite a mandate to do whatever it wants, essentially. And uh, again, my familiarity here uh, with the uh, American political culture, see, I connect the way in which we have militarized the responses to the gun culture that is embedded in the society itself. In other words, the, the whole don't tread on me ethos of American society is extremely biasing in the way we think and act in response to challenges. Now, again, this is, to me, would be illuminated by some more comparative study of how, uh, you know, what is the defining metaphors for other political cultures, you know, how, how do, uh, Latin American countries or Spain or India uh, address uh, the same issue? Do they have that same kind of underlying uh, alpha male uh, view of how uh, to deal with threats? See, and I think, I think that's so important in the American context, uh, aside from all these other dimensions of militarization. Uh, that I uh, alluded to. Yeah, um, I teach at California State uh, University at Long Beach, and last night they had a forum on our campus uh, talking about uh, international terrorism, and in particular because on November 13th, one of our students, Noemi Gonzalez, was killed sitting at a restaurant in Paris by yeah, the saw, uh, terrorists. So it raised a great deal of awareness. 
And uh, in part of this, I, what I'd like to ask would be the ramifications that you see in terms of international law, in particular, the balance between state security and civil rights, human rights. And in particular, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And in, the, and in response to this, there were particular presidential candidates who laid the blame at Edward Snowden. And the debate going on about civil rights, and in particular surveillance uh, and, and cyber rights and, and so forth, I think I was wondering if you could speculate about where, where you see the trends moving in these areas. Uh, see, see it, uh, it's a very important question. Actually, uh, uh, I have a former student uh, who's, yes, Larry Jar, who's very interesting on these kind of issues. Oh, is that right? Yes. He, he's a very good guy, uh, very smart, too. Uh, see, I think it, uh, what I regarded as a world order challenge, not an international law. International law was really made for a state-centric world. And it's, it's obsolete, really, when you're dealing with these issues from both sides, both from the, uh, uh, the side that is uh, resisting what they regard as an oppressive international political order and the side that's trying to stabilize that order. Uh, uh, both sides uh, are, are, have to really uh, uh, break the logic of state centrism in order to uh, formulate their own policies and their own behavior. Uh, uh, so, so we're in a new world order situation which has no normative order. There's no normative framework that we can use. Uh, and even the ethical frameworks of respecting innocence or respecting a civilian life. Both sides have violated that in radical fashion. And, and certainly the Western liberal democracies, the way they fought uh, World War II was uh, mega forms of state terrorism. I mean, when you drop atomic bombs on uh, Japanese cities that have no military relevance to the war, and Japan is trying to negotiate an, an end to the war at the, in any event, that's, if you don't call that terrorism of the, of the most uh, enduring kind, and you know, if you, everywhere but the United States, the two images that are, that uh, exemplify the horror of World War II are Hiroshima and Auschwitz. Those are the two things people remember as, uh, as uh, traumatizing images. Uh, and so uh, I don't know how, I think uh, th there needs to be another project <laughs> on generating a normative order for a post-state uh, security system. We don't have it. We, we, and, and all these Snowden questions, it's a legit, I mean, I'm basically sympathetic with what uh, Snowden did, but the other side has a point because, and it goes back to the imminent threat uh, 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 comment and question earlier. Uh, there, you have to do something. And what is it you do? Uh, that doesn't imperil everything else you believe in or supposedly believe in. So it's a very uh, complicated and difficult and, and nobody, ha anyone that says they have the answers uh, is a liar, you know, and uh, Donald Trump may be the uh, best <laughs> exemplification of that uh, uh, truism. There's one more. Should we give the one more question? Back your play on this one because we can't just come from a law enforcement, you know, type perspective. It's too. This is too big for that, and that puts us within the Western, you know, centric paradigm of states. 
What I think is happening is warfare itself is shifting from state-centric sovereign issues into something where we have challengers to that system and the wars are about you know, political and social organization, how people are gonna live, what are the rights are, are we gonna have slavery, are we gonna have all these, these issues? So in some way, we're pre-modern, but also post-modern in the uh, debates and the wars that are kind of coming here. Yeah, no, I, I completely share that view. Thank Good. you. Welcome back. Um, we are now going to hear from the co-convener of the conference, Richard Birchall, on legal constructions. Right, thanks, Michael. Uh, just want to sort of convey a bit of personal thanks to everybody. Uh, very enjoyable uh, conversations yesterday, both the presentations and the discussions. I'm learning a lot. Um, so we certainly appreciate being here and look forward to the rest of the day. Now, I got to admit, typically when you come to sort of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary events and you suggest to talk about law, um, you got to spend the first sort of hour trying to justify why you're going to bother talking about the law. So I must say, I have been pleasantly surprised, have very much welcomed the references, the discussion, some of the debates we've already had about legal aspects of terrorism. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm encouraged that we do have something uh, to talk about, something to share. Um, at the same time, um, given some of the comments we've heard as well, I'm going to struggle slightly to say something new, something interesting. Uh, and I see that Professor Falk has left. All right, after declaring international law is obsolete, I'll have to try to find a reason um, to have a discussion about it. Now, I do recognize as well that when we're talking about legal constructions of terrorism, we are talking about formal, hierarchical, institutionalized things. And I know for a lot of people in the social sciences, well, we have to hate it from the outset because it's formal, it's hierarchical, it's institutionalized. But that's the way it is, that's the way it works, that's the way we understand law. But also in this area of terrorism or counterterrorism, we're seeing uses of law, appeals to law, framing a lot of our debate, part of the emotive structures that we've talked about. It seems to have a very large role, uh, seems to be doing a lot of different things, but that's also part of the problem. The way the law is being used is being used in a whole variety of different ways, and we're actually seeing some significant problems in how we go about constructing our legal understandings of terrorism. Um, and these problems aren't just about sort of incoherence, sort of a lack of understanding, but it's actually now starting to demonstrate it's getting in the way of cooperation to try to respond to terrorist activities. And it's also getting in the way, I mean, as Anthony was telling us yesterday, of trying to deal with some of the core causes. So what I find intriguing is that we seem to be desperate to create bigger, more legal regimes to deal with terrorism. We want more law. That seems to be the answer to everything. And this has been a process that's been going on for a number of years, but yet there's still call for more law both internationally and domestically. Now, we've already heard um, from the presentation so far that we can see some of the problems when we're looking at legal constructions. The definition issue is obviously huge. Um, do we define what we're looking at or we define at our responses? How does that help us out? We do have to do something. I mean, if a politician just stand back and sort of say, well, not to worry about it, it won't happen again when the bodies start piling up, as was eloquently put yesterday, we do have problems. Also, the politics of it, yes, legal constructions are a result of political, social, and cultural aspects. We can't get away from that. If we look at a global perspective, we have 190 plus whatever states. There's a lot of differenti differences in views, perspectives, and what actually needs to be done. What I want to sort of look at is when we create these sort of legal constructions is first, of, first off identifying the act we want to look at, because laws have to be somewhat precise in identifying what the problem is. Then this sort of administrative structure revolves around it, about enforcement, investigatory powers, how we deal with it. But then also, there has to be a rhetoric behind it. 
Why is this law important? Why do we have it in our society? What purpose does it serve? And this rhetoric in dealing with the law on terrorism is quite interesting because it's a very high part of that emotive aspect. Um, and we seem to be grasping at a lot of straws. And also the biggest problem in ha ha some of the discussions uh, I had informally yesterday is that we don't necessarily need to be constructing more law to define terrorism, but it seems states and governments are desperate to have more law for earlier interventions, for more authority, for investigations, but yet at the same time they keep saying they want more and more and more. So we hear these great news stories, terrorist plot was foiled, our legal system's great, our police are doing a good job, but then there's some sort of attack, we need more legal systems. Uh, we need more laws, we need more powers in there. So in looking at sort of the act, the administration, and the rhetoric part of it, um, we can see some of the problems, some of the difficulties in trying to construct some of these ideas of dealing with uh, the legal understandings of terrorism. Now, to reference Clark once again, I think he, <laughs> a number of people said he summarized it quite well. And from my perspective, he has summarized it quite well. Um, Governments do need to show this really strong response, this emotive response, um, and they're doing it. Uh, whereas they may be better off just using the systems they have in place, and in that way it won't be too much of a difficulty. When looking at sort of legal constructions, there is an issue about precision. We do have to clearly, or attempt to clearly define what it is we're talking about. So yes, I understand as social science researchers, we can come up with multiple definitions depending on multiple purposes to achieve multiple objectives, that, that, fine. But when the legal system's created, it has to come up with at least a somewhat precise definition, it has to come up with something coherent, it has to come up with something that allows for predictability, allows for action to be taken, hopefully, potentially allows for a strategy as well. But we're starting to see, I don't think there was ever a decent construction of terrorism through legal terms, but we're starting to see an absolute falling apart of it. Everything now almost seems to be terrorism, or everything you do can be associated with terrorism, and we're getting into circular arguments. If you do this act, you're a terrorist, because these acts are terrorist acts, and we just keep going around and around in circles without ever defining what it is we're actually looking at it. And as I mentioned, poorly constructed legal regimes cause problems. They may add to the sense of grievance, the sense of injustice for some, they may feel the law is picking on them. But more importantly, at a practical level, they actually create problems. If we can't actually go into communities and talk to people to find out their thoughts, their ideas, to help deal with some of those underlying factors, because to even talk to them is contributing to a terrorist cause, which we're seeing in a number of countries, that creates problems. Plus, we're starting to see in the level of international cooperation on dealing with counterterrorism, real problems, States are building up their domestic legal systems to such an extent that they can't even talk to each other about terrorism anymore because their understandings, their constructions are at odds with each other and it causes large political difficulties. So one scholar has said essentially global counterterrorism is a bunch of sovereign ships passing in the night someplace. Um, and it doesn't actually help. Now one of the things we've talked about quite a bit is Terrorism as being different than other criminal acts and how it has to have a certain gravity to it. it has to, we have to sort of amplify, amplify the importance. And this is something international law is now attempting to deal with. And this is what I find intriguing. I'll use one example from international law to show how sort of problematic our constructions are. We hear on a regular basis that there are maybe 13, 15, 19 international treaties dealing with counterterrorism. Now this is an interesting example in its own right. We seem to have to have a large number. And so some people say, well that's a treaty, no that's just an addition to a treaty. No, no, we'll call that a treaty as well. It shows we're doing more. So even the UN can't figure out how many global terrorism treaties it has. Very interesting on that one. But everybody wants to go for a big number. What I find interesting in this, this sort of category is of treaties, quite often called the suppression treaties, up until the 1980s, not a one of them mentioned the word terrorism. And they weren't even designed to deal with terrorism at the time, but retrospectively we now say, ooh, these are part of our global framework for dealing with counterterrorism. The first suppression treaty in 1963 dealing with the offenses aboard aircraft is a great example of this. It was drawn up so states could better deal with jurisdictional issues over aircraft. 
We had a new phenomenon, these things flying back and forth. What happens when there's a problem on board? Who has jurisdiction over it? Who's responsible? So it's a very pragmatic thing to deal with international cooperation. But all of a sudden, 20 years down the road, we now start saying it's a counterterrorism treaty. And it's like, well, why? Um, mainly because of the act, offenses aboard of aircraft. But these offenses were illegal under most jurisdictions anyway. So why did we need, why do we need to classify this as counterterrorism is a bit of a problem. More of a problem was the sort of offenses, the mischief the act was designed to deal with. Quite simply, it says that any offenses against criminal law are illegal under this treaty. Fine. But then it also goes on to say other acts, whether or not they're illegal, that jeopardize the safety of the aircraft or jeopardize good order and discipline. A very vague sort of emotive type of term of good order and discipline. And I emphasize this one because that's what we're starting to see in some of the domestic law now. Any act which jeopardizes this very vague understanding um, becomes quite problematic. But from this, international law started developing more acts, more administrative arrangements for dealing with these acts, and started to delve into a bit more of the rhetoric about it. So we saw in the various treaties that were adopted in the 70s and the 80s, states must adopt more severe penalties for dealing with these things. States must agree to cooperate with each other so we eliminate the possibility of anybody escaping prosecution. But at the same time, as we've talked about already in a number of ways, these acts that they were dealing with, you know, blowing up airports, killing people, kidnapping, hijacking, were already criminal offenses. But the idea was that you had to make it a much more severe penalty to address the problem. And believe it or not, some of these treaties started talking about this is a good deterrence. I'm not really sure the deterrence factor ever worked or where it came from. But the interesting point was that up until 1997, we never had mention of the word terrorism. Things changed in 1997. We had a convention on terrorist bombings, and in 1999, we had a convention on terrorist financing. The Convention on Terrorist Bombings gives us the act. It's unlawful to illegally place an explosive device, but it also gives us the intention. Your intention is to cause death or great damage. Doesn't mention your motive. And that's an interesting thing about the constructions we're seeing today, where act and intention is, or act and motive are displacing act and intention. And that's gonna cause difficulties down the road. Same with the terrorist financing convention. They had to actually come up with some sort of definition of terrorism for good or bad. Uh, but again, it is about causing death, injury, damage to property to intimidate or to compel somebody to do something. Um, and then the international system kept trying to work on a agreed definition. They can't come up with it. Or they've actually been able to come up with an agreed definition. They can't come up with the whole treaty because they're not sure who the definition applies to. Motive is becoming more important um, than the intentions. And I'm not going to go through the various uh, definitions um, because we've already had a bit of a discussion about that. But essentially what we've seen in the international system is more and more legal responses. Post 9-11, 2001, we see a massive jump and the number of countries that have agreed to these treaties. So these treaties have been around from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They had a decent take up, 60s, 70s states. Not bad, not that great. Post 9-11, everybody signed up to them all of a sudden. And everybody took that as an authority to start changing their, their domestic law on terrorism as well. Which is intriguing because one of the purpose of these international treaties was it was actually permissive jurisdiction. It allowed you to create this crime under your domestic legal system. So you didn't have to go through the legislation to pass it, you had jurisdiction. It gave states a pile of authority to do stuff. But yet they felt they needed to do more, they needed to do more. Which to me demonstrates either a complete misunderstanding of terrorism or a complete misunderstanding on how we deal with it. But it also created this sort of rhetorical, this normative situation where we want to sort of outright condemn terrorism, condemn the use of violence through illegal means to intimidate or compel somebody to do something. Now, the impact the sort of um, international legal constructions had on the domestic has been quite marked. 
Um, we're starting to see the acts, then the rhetoric. So forget the administration side of it. Let's forget developing effective application of this law. Let's get right into the importance of this, and then let's have the emotive side of it and essentially start shooting in the dark, both literally and figuratively. One of the biggest problems we're seeing in the domestic sphere, as I've already mentioned, is we're just sort of saying that if we find what you do, sorry, if we find what you believe in to be offensive, and you do one of these acts, then you have to be a terrorist. And if we're gonna designate you or see you as a terrorist, then that just securitizes a whole range of other issues and allows us to do other things. Earlier interventions, investigations, lack of decent criminal trials, um, rights get removed, a number of other things. This is causing real problems with a number of criminal law systems because domestic criminal law systems look at the act. It's illegal to kill somebody, okay? Then it starts looking at the intention. Did you purposely kill somebody or did you unintentionally kill somebody? And then we'll answer that question. So it's the act and then your state of mind in doing it. Nobody asks about the motive. But now the domestic systems are bringing in the motive. And the motive is getting very vague. This is, on one hand, is actually making it more difficult to prosecute, to arrest, to get investigatory powers, because you can't prove the motive, even though it's still an illegal act. Or, on the other hand, there's a whole range of examples. States are just using these powers to deal with anything they don't like. So, I'm not sure if it's ironic or just really problematic. France is currently dealing with protesters at the climate change through the emergency powers they brought in to deal with the terrorist attacks. And that just is not acceptable if we want to come up with something more coherent that actually helps us to deal with the problem. Part of the emphasis on motive, I believe, is also just misplacing our efforts and our concerns. Take the unfortunate recent events here in California and San Bernardino. The newspaper this morning had a huge headline. What was their motive? And I said, well, why do we need to be getting their motive into this? They've killed 14 people. That's murder and a discussion. Let's, they're dead. But if they were still, if we had them in custody, let's prosecute them and move on with it. It's this interesting dilemma now that we're seeing at both the international and the domestic level. States are desperate to show they have these strong legal systems. For some reason, they want to be telling everybody that we can take care of all these people that are going to threaten us one way or the other. But yet, they seem to be moving, as we were discussing yesterday, to we're gonna th what you believe in threatens us, and so we're going to somehow start to criminalize that. We're going to se somehow start to prohibit that. But that's a real problem, because if I just sit at home thinking about robbing a bank, they can't come and arrest me. Okay, So my motive is to go rob a bank and get rich. But if I'm just sitting at home thinking about it, what do we do? Equally, if people are sitting at home and they're thinking about overthrowing the government, do we sort of say, well, they have, their motive is a problem, so the act and the intention we're not gonna sort of worry about, it's just gonna get straight to their motive. That can become problematic. And looking at some of the other ele elements to it, um, focusing on the motive allows the emotion come into it, it gets very subjective, it gets very problematic, and it gets very inconsistent. That's the other difficulty. And I think that's something that you know, Anthony pointed out quite well in the UK situation, the inconsistency is a real problem. There's also a practical problem. The more law, the more availability has not resulted in better law enforcement, better investigations, better supervision processes. The Belgium example following the Paris attacks was classic. You had a local administrator, you had a state administrator, and you had a federal administrator all saying they spoke to each other. Security forces all knew about it, but this person didn't really care. It was competition between the uh, security forces. So the over-dramatization or the over-emotive fact of in dealing with terrorism as a crime seems to be actually hindering cooperation because you have the authorities sort of competing with each other to either resolve the problem or say it's not our problem. And I'm not really sure how we can get along with that. But essentially, as we start looking at constructions of terrorism and law, we do need to try to find things that are precise, predictable, identifiable, so we can actually respond to the mischief to the problem we're trying to address. Right now, I mean, again, just to use sort of Clark's view, they just want to show that we're having this huge response, and that's it. And they're not sort of thinking it through. 
I mean, again, the UK is a great example. How many different counterterrorism or counterextremism bills, acts, have they had since 2000? Every year, if not every other year? Um, and they still haven't come up with a way of resolving the problem. So the difficulty we're seeing is that I can see the use for law, I can see why we should have it, I can see how it can help. At the same time, it definitely looks like bringing in the emotive element, which has really added a lot to the way I look at this, is helping us to explain where the problems are. We're not actually getting any coherence out of it. And I think what we're gonna see, if these developments continue in this direction, which all signs indicate they're going to be, in attempting to deal with the issue of terrorism, both at sort of stopping extremism, stopping radicalization, we're gonna struggle, and attempting to deal with it in terms of just criminal justice techniques, police powers, investigatory aspects, we're gonna struggle because we've over-securitized the issue. And certainly, in many respects, we're adding to the rhetoric of the bad guys in many respects. We're just giving evidence to show that, yeah, our systems aren't working, our systems are oppressive, our systems are out to get you because that's what you believe. So forget the fact that you've done it or not, it's just you. That's who we're out to get. So, I mean, just to conclude, it was quite disturbing after 9-11 that Jeremy Greenstock, the US, UK ambassador to the UN, said what looks, kills, and smells like terrorism is terrorism. Unfortunately, our legal constructions are going in the same way. Thanks. <laughs> very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, I, I, just to reinforce your one of your main points, uh, the shift from intention to motive in criminal law is a radical change because uh, what we were taught in law school was that motive is irrelevant, not only that it's uh, not part of, but it should be excluded from the assessment of crime. And the International Court of Justice has made that very clear in the worst of international crimes, genocide, where they put a very high threshold on establishing the specificity of the intent and completely ignore the motive. Yeah. So, this, so the treatment is, it seems to me, a, a really radical modification of the way in which uh, criminal law jurisprudence has been generally understood in liberal uh, Western societies. Mm. One other observation that, uh, that, again, I think flows from what you were saying. In the 1960s in South Africa, the anti-terrorist laws were used to um, criminally punish anyone who advocated a changed racial relationship between uh, Africans and the white population. So it does have a, uh, there is a, uh, a long uh, experience of using the emotive side of terrorism as a way of demonizing that which you don't, which the governing elites don't want to have happen and use in integrating that into the legal order. Yeah, yeah. But I think part of the difficulty we're getting with that second point is that it almost seems like everybody's doing it now. And they, they're not just pointing to the system being under threat, but they actually use the words, the current government, which can get real problematic because you can essentially just use it against all your sort of opponents. And it's not just in those non-liberal states, it's happening on a much wider scale either directly or indirectly. Uh, but you're right, I mean, it, it's not new in that respect. But also on your point about the intention, the motive, most definitely in domestic law, yeah, we don't even ask the motive. But what I find interesting with these suppression conventions as they developed over time, and again, this is trying to put a reading on international law, the preambles did start to sort of say these acts threaten international peace and security. They started to read a little bit of a motive in it, even though, in international law, anything that threatens international peace and security is a catch-all term. So it's not really that uh, important. But at the same time, they were starting to look at some sort of motive in a way, um, because again, they, weren't, they didn't seem to be that worried about the intention, 
But that was a framework on top of the domestic law, so it's less of, a, less of an issue at that level, yeah. I was just curious about, so um, the thing that this kind of started making me think about when you talked about the role of motive when the criminal process was specifically with hate crimes. Um, and my curiosity was whether this uh, same argument that you're making is also an argument against hate crime legislation, yeah. and if you could just kind of expound on the, that thinking. Yeah, I mean, the purpose of hate crime legislation wasn't to create a new offense. It wasn't there to create, it was there to add to the process. So you beat somebody up, you murder somebody, that in itself is the crime you're gonna be prosecuted for. The hate crime element, and again, hate crimes are causing problems. They're not, the legislation is not all that clear in certain places, they're causing difficulties for prosecution. You did see at first, in a number of jurisdictions, everything became a hate crime, and then, oops, this is actually causing more troubles than it's worth in many respects. And again, it's there, it's, that's part of the rhetorical process. We wanna demonstrate that if people go and they do this because of, then that is a problem. Um, but again, motive doesn't quite fit into it in the way one could argue because the purpose of the hate crime is that you beat somebody up, you kill somebody because of one of their attributes. You weren't out there, you weren't motivated by it. You were using it as the object of your violence. Now, but then again, others will argue that it is a motivation, that's the only reason you attack that person. And this is part of the difficulty. Because, I mean, there's been some cases in the UK where during a fight or during a violent thing, somebody said an offensive term. That must be a hate crime. And they said, well, the, the understanding of it afterwards, that wasn't even close to being a hate crime. But yeah, it's a similar sort of aspect. Yeah, we're seeing this. We want to move towards this motivation. I'm not sure if it helps us. Um, but again, it shows, it shows governments trying to deal with what they perceive to be a problem based on the social pressures they're feeling. So I've got two questions. Um, the first is, if you had to boil this down to a policy prescription, right? Um, so we made you international law dictator. Uh, what, what, that sounds attractive. What would, what would you, uh, what would you recommend is that, is that policy prescription we need to do to make, to make this function uh, in a useful way? I mean, essentially, it's, I think it's one of those things, yes, we need to put the label of terrorism on a lot of these things to help ensure it gets people going, to help ensure we can get the resources into it, to help ensure we can get the cooperation. Um, but we have to keep in mind that the acts we're looking at are already criminal acts. So we don't have to make a huge jump. Um, and the jump is relatively straightforward with the intention to cause terror, the intention to cause a disruption, major disruption, um, to intimidate, to compel somebody. So we already have the offenses, and we just need to sort of look at the intention side of it, and all this other ancillary stuff that's happening around it, just leave that alone, okay? Stop sort of piling everything into it at the same time. So the policy prescription would be just keep it narrowly defined, you will be able to prosecute, you will be able to act upon it, you will be able to create a rhetoric, rhetoric around it to show you're doing something. But at the same time, I mean, this point was brought up yesterday, if now everybody who's motivated to commit violence is obviously intending to overthrow the government, we have to investigate everybody in society. So what do we do now? Um, so yeah, if we keep going down this route, it's a complete waste of time and resources. Well, it certainly would up some people's budget. Uh, which I think has something to do with it. Uh, <laughs> my, my other question is, based on the discussion we were having yesterday about definitions and operationalizations, uh, and I have a biased desire for your answer here, uh, do you think that this distinction you're making between motivation and intention is something we should be importing more fully into how we're thinking about operationalizing and defining terrorism within the context of research? Can you give me a bit more on that? I'm not sure where you going with. So if I'm sitting around and I just saw an incident or I'm yeah. looking at an organization and I'm trying to decide, does it go into the GTD, does it go into the bad data set, 
you've laid out a very interesting distinction between motivations and intentions. Mm. Should we be trying to adopt that kind of distinction and focusing on what you're talking about when we're trying to take, oh, let's say San Bernardino mm. or a domestic hate crime uh, of another group uh, in yeah. how we're putting into no, not making our No, not necessarily, because, I mean, it's, like I said, when looking at the legal constructions, we are looking at formal aspects. But I can see the benefit, the need, um, to have different understandings because it helps us to bring in other expo explanations. It helps us to bring in other factors to understand the wider process of it. Um, so no, I wouldn't sort of say, let's keep it narrow and that will help us. It's not gonna help us, really, okay? Um, but in the sort of more formal structures, we do <coughs> need to be looking at not having multiple definitions, not having sort of multiple approaches to definitions, but trying to bit, bring a bit more precision to the definition we wanna use in the legal sphere. Okay. Yeah, uh, I would I would like to make you one question. It's about in the international law. It's like uh, one of the capacities that is given to the to the countries is their 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 um, they can have the capacity to recognize a nation. I mean, it's like a free capacity, a free uh, power of the of the nations. What would happen? Do you think would be possible that suddenly one mm, Middle East country or one Asian country, whatever? whoever would recognize the Islamic State as a new state? I mean, it's, would, yeah. be, would, be, would be possible in the aspect that it's a free, it's a free capacity. Do yeah, you yeah. think that oh, would yeah. happen? And in that case, yeah. how could that affect to, the, to, a, to a new international order? Yeah. Um, I don't, from a PR perspective, I can't see any individual sovereign state recognizing them as a state. Uh, the whole recognition process is very much a political process and is tied up with a whole range of other things. So you could actually be a state, uh, having population, territory, the ability to enter, enter international relations, and nobody recognize you. Um, or everybody tries to recognize you, whether or not you have this capacity. Um, so you have these very various gray areas. I can't really see anybody, and other people be interested in your views, anybody recognizing Islamic State, to be honest with you. Um, I just completely impractical, but I think just from a PR perspective, um, you'd have a hard time explaining that, not just your own population, no matter who you are, but trying to explain it to your neighbors, first time you show up at an international event, yeah, we're the guys that recognize Dash. Oh, you go sit outside. <laughs> um, you're right, it could happen. Uh, it happened in um, Afghanistan. Uh, we had different levels of recognition, um, with only a few states recognizing the Taliban regime at one time, then withdrawing recognition down the road. Um, yeah, it's possible, but I don't see it happening. But Islamic State has Mosul, it's the second most producer oil place. So they always have like a, a resource that can convince other countries to recognize them. No, I mean, they have resources in that aspect for yeah. for me. Yeah, but again, it's a much bigger process. Kosovo is a great example. You have a European Union recognition, a number of Western states have recognized it, even though not all European Union states have, I don't think. But given the fact that Russia won't recognize it and Serbia won't recognize it, it doesn't really matter if everybody else recognizes them or not. It's still caught up in that political process. Um, no, I think Dash having control over oil and resources would never force anybody to have to recognize it. They may have to recognize and deal with them as an insurgency, as we talked about yesterday, but never as a state. Perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs>